Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. I'm Mason Voth, joined now by Drew Galloway and Jimmy, a.k.a. KSU Fan. And uh, we are here to recap the Wildcats' big win over SEMO, 45 nothing on Saturday. For K-State, I mean, it was probably about as good as you could have asked for. Uh, they executed a lot of the things that they probably wanted to earlier in the week. They played a ton of guys. I think the note after the game was 77 players entered last night's game for K-State. And uh, the big one, obviously, being that a bunch of freshmen played, probably most notably Avery Johnson late in the game. But there were a lot of freshmen that were able to get in earlier when it, you know the game, I guess, was, was not in doubt yet. Um, so – Really a good performance all around for K-State last night. So we'll kick things off with just uh, immediate kind of instant takeaways, things that stood out to you guys from last night's game. Drew, we'll let you lead it off. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Colin Klein was kind of in his bag last night. The offense was clicking on all cylinders. The starters for the offense only didn't score two times the entire, the entire game. And one was in the first half when Will Howard threw the interception. And the other time was... Uh, I think it was the first or second drive of the second half where uh, they ended up having to punt. And then the, the, when the backups came in, they didn't miss a beat either. So the offense was as good as advertised. That was without Keegan Johnson, which was the most impressive thing to me. Fan, we'll, uh, we'll let you, you knock yours out then. Yeah, we, we, uh, we talk about how Kleiman has dominated and played well against the FCS teams. This was his fourth game, and this was by far the best K-State has looked against FBS team or FCS team. Um, 5.8 points per drive is pretty incredible. Almost six points per drive is really tough. 61% success rate, almost nine yards per play. Uh, but, and that, this is non-garbage time stuff, so it didn't really even include any second-half plays. And then your defense, zero points, three, three yards per play, and a 32% success rate for SEMO. Um, both sides of the ball, K-State hasn't done that even even in the Nichols game, which was their best other performance against FCS under Kleiman. So pretty impressive start and uh, efficient start on both sides of the ball. I mean, uh, I, I thought for me the the thing that I came away early on, I think it was good to see that with Keegan Johnson being out, the receivers were able to step up. Will Howard, obviously the confidence had not gone away over the summer. Um, I, I was telling people before the game yesterday, like, as awesome as he was last year, and as much as I I do th think that like that's the real Will Howard now, because of what we saw those first two years, it's still like you're waiting for that shoe to drop, like up. Oh, he's going to revert back at some point, but it's pretty clear that he's not, and uh, that he is going to be on the trajectory that a lot of people see him this year. So, I mean, the offense obviously has to be the story. Um, my concern going forward now is we didn't really. To me, we didn't get a, a great idea of what the defense is, at least the parts of it that we're worried about with the secondary, because the defensive line was, you know, maybe they don't have crazy amounts of sacks, but they were able to get a lot of pressure that maybe was unexpected at times. They were able to do it early. Um, it, it never felt like the secondary was really truly tested. So that's probably going to be one of the things that I'm, I'm most interested in as we kind of move forward to uh, next week against Troy to see what K-State ends up looking like against them. It's a quarterback with experience at the FBS level. Troy's a pretty solid team. Um, I, I've always said I don't know why K-State for some reason finds a reason to schedule the top 15 FCS schools than these really talented G5 schools. West Virginia somehow finds the worst FCS schools imaginable. We, we got to get you know Chris Kleiman and Gene Taylor on that, uh, figure that out. But I, I think to me that's the one thing that I'm not worried about it, but I'm just still – not confident in what we saw from the secondary because I don't think that they were challenged yesterday. So that would uh, be what my cause for concern moving forward is. And uh, we'll, we'll let fan take this uh, this time on the, the first go on what you might have cause for concern after game number one. Yeah, I, th I think you guys, you and D.Y. talked a, bit, a little bit last night after the game, but uh, the offensive line early kind of, I mean, the first drive they were good. Ward had a couple of nice carries, but uh, there was a stretch in the first and second quarters where they had, 11 runs in a row that gained 36 yards. So that's under four yards of carry. The success rate on those was only 27%. And eight of those carries only gained three yards or fewer. So uh, and the, w that same stretch also saw the, the uh, pressure and the interception by Will. So that was a bit disappointing to see kind of that stretch early in the game with, with all the hype on the offensive line and all the talent they had back. But um, I do know SEMO 
one of their strengths on defense was probably their defensive line. So maybe it wasn't as quite as big a surprise, but that would be my major concern or not a major concern, but a, a concern going into the future. Go ahead, Drew. What what do you you see as a concern? I, I'm I'm going to guess you're probably along the same lines of what we've already mentioned. So uh, if you want to add to it, or if you've got something that's kind of off the radar, yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Of it's it's the offensive line for me because I felt like this was a game that they could have just overwhelmed the opponent, but they didn't really play consistently throughout. I mean, Jimmy hit on it with some of the numbers, but the one thing that really stood out to me was having to go read option to score uh, on third and goal after not being able to get enough, uh, I, I, instead of being able to just punch it in from the one yard line on the QB sneak, it, it, that was kind of at the peak of the struggles, but then they were fine throughout the rest of the game. So I think it might've just taken them a little bit to get going. And it's a little bit of a cause for concern going forward because Troy has a pretty physical defensive line too. So it'll be something that I'll be keeping an eye on next week as well. Yeah, I mean, I the offensive line, I guess, is one of those things. But I, I told you guys last night, I'm trying to not be so critical of the offensive line because I I found myself last year at times I I would be kind of critical of, of certain aspects of it. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be nice. I'm gonna you know keep a level head about it, and uh, we'll see how things look next week. But I mean, that is something to take note of. And um, I was going down to the field right as Will threw the interception. But by the sounds of it, that was probably a more of an offensive line-induced interception. I know it was third down, so, you know, he was just kind of chucking one up there. But it seems like it was there was no time for him there. Am, am I correct in my assessment of that? Yeah, he was, he was definitely pressured. But he did – it was kind of thrown into three defenders. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I haven't watched it again to see where the receiver was in in that that mix, but I, I w- it was more pressured because he was definitely hit as he threw it. Well, let's uh, let's move in. Ben Sennett is a notable one. Uh, he ended up with with five catches basically immediately, and then didn't get another one after that as a. Uh, Drew and I were, were patiently waiting on with uh, us thinking that he would get over five and a half. He he obviously was good. And then I think, you know, to me, the probably the biggest bright spot was the fact that even with Keegan Johnson out, and it should be noted, like that's not an immediate cause for concern. Chris Klein, I don't need to put too much stock into it, just said he got nicked up in practice. But even with him out, K-State came out firing, throwing the ball well early. And Jaden Jackson was able to catch a touchdown. R.J. Garcia looked good. So they were able to, to go out and still do some things, even with some receiver trouble. Um, wh- what did you guys make of the receiving core last night and, and where they can go on from this? Yeah, I, I thought they were really good. Um, R.J. Garcia, you know, there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about him after the Big 12 championship game and, and his, his touchdown in that game. And I thought he showed – pretty well tonight with his catches and and leading the team in in yards and and getting the score. So that was impressive. Uh, Brooks didn't have a lot of yards, but he still had six catches and kind of showed that, you know, short yardage um, underneath kind of guy. And then Jaden Jackson with that first touchdown was, was, was nice to see as well. So I thought, I thought they were bright and I thought, uh, you know, throwing Senate in there and overall without Johnson, that's a pretty good day. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Without Keegan Johnson, you can really see where the offense can go because it feels like if they can get almost 300 yards against FEMO passing without Keegan Johnson, what can they do against some of these uh, higher quality opponents? We really saw what the hype was about RJ Garcia that we've been hearing for the last two years. It all, it all came together. I thought the sideline catch was better than his uh, touchdown catch that he had where he dragged the toes on the sideline caught it. I thought Jaden Jackson looked really good. He looked really good in the Sugar Bowl, too, even though it was garbage time when he was in. But he showed some promise there and caught the first touchdown. Ben Sennett is an absolute stud. 
with him with Mel Kiper having him as the tight end three, the tight end three last year was picked at pick thirty six. I mean, it, it's very possible he could be a second round pick. I mean, yes, yeah, Senate was great, and that was kind of what I expected from him when we wrote about our overs and unders. Is it just felt like one of those games where he was going to find himself open quite a bit, be able to do a lot. He did, came through. K State ends up with two one hundred yard receivers in Senate and Garcia. Um, and then RJ gets uh, some extra yards after he recovered that fumble, too, that Ben Sennett had. So the rest look good. Keegan Johnson, we'll see what that ends up looking like. Based off how Chris Kleiman talked after the game, it seems like he'll probably play next week against Troy, would be my assumption. And then Casey will kind of be full. Now, at one point in the game, RJ Garcia got banged up. He had a leave. And I think the receivers on the field, I'm trying to think. What it ended up, I think it was Jaden Jackson, Phillip Brooks, and Seth Porter at one point. Uh, are there any concerns about receiver depth in, in your guys' eyes yet? That if K State loses one and a half guys, basically, they're, they're in some real trouble. Uh, maybe right now, because we're still kind of waiting and seeing. They're bringing Trace Bivy and Jace Brown along, they got to play at the end of the game a lot. So maybe right now, because we don't know who those next like one or two guys will be behind those three if if somebody goes down. But later on in the season, I, I don't have any worries, really. Yeah, definitely definitely a lot of youth behind them, but um, they looked talented in, in the action they got in this game. So, you know, we only played three or four guys really last year. So I think the hope is, you know, uh, client – Klein seems to be a, a short rotation with the receiver kind of guy, so um, I'm sure they're hoping no one gets hurt. But it, it, with Johnson's history, that that could be a concern too. That's that's a good point on on Keegan Johnson. For most guys, I, I would have just been like, yeah, little thing, not a concern. But there is the injury history there, so it's something that you got to kind of take into consideration. Will Howard was good last night, outside of the one pick that we mentioned. Um, was there anything that you saw differently from him, even than what we saw last year that made you think, okay, he's taken like another step here, whether it's in, you know, the mental and confidence side of it, or if it's in something that he can do physically, um, was there anything that stood out about Will Howard last night, other than the fact that he is legitimately one of the better quarterbacks in the big 12 and is a true candidate to be a quarterback taken in the NFL draft this upcoming year? I'd say there were, you know, there were some tight window throws, but we kind of saw those last year. Um, there was one along the sideline to Ben Sennett. Um, I, I know that was was a tight one, uh, the one that he fumbled on and that King Johnson picked up and ran with. Um, but I, I don't know if there's anything from this game you could say that was better just because Simo is, you know, I don't know how strong their secondary is compared to even Troy or, or Mizzou, who we'll, who we'll see the next couple of weeks. So, he, he, he looked how I expect him to look. You know, he made good throws, tight throws. Maybe tried to force the one, although he had pressure on the interception. Uh, and then, you know, wasn't asked to run it much, but when he did keep it on that uh, keeper, um, was was open. Uh, then the, the the little throwback play for the touchdown reception was kind of cool to see too. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There was nothing really that we saw that was really new, but it's still good to see him after he throws the interception to just dust it off and immediately come back and sling it all around the yard and throwing it in an even tighter window than the one that he threw the interception on. And that, that one to send it really st- stands out as a throw. And I was like, holy cow, how did that get in there? Yeah, I, I think uh, to me, like, that's probably, other than the fact that, like, he's just he kind of letting it fly and he's he's not afraid to, to take – some chances and execute the big plays now and just seems to have a better grasp and feel for it than he did his first two back that when he does make a mistake a mistake he's not afraid to go back out there and push it and maybe in some circumstances at some point down the road that will get k-state into a little bit more trouble than what they want or what they need but more times than not that's going to be a good thing to have a quarterback that plays and has the mentality that will howard does um, and, and, yeah, we probably didn't see anything crazy new from him last night, but I think the assumption can just be that he's continued to get a little bit better and he was already pretty good by the end of last season. So 
uh, to see him kind of keep developing this year. It'll it'll be interesting to kind of watch how things end up playing out over the, the final two non-conference games and then uh, once conference play kind of gets started because, you know, we'll talk about the Big 12 in a little bit, but week one kind of makes you reconsider everything you thought about the league going into uh, this season, other than the fact that maybe you still think that K-State, Oklahoma, and Texas are – are the three best teams, but that's maybe even a little bit different because a lot of people probably like myself thought Texas tech was going to be the third best team. Um, so we'll just kind of see how it goes on there. Uh, similar to Chris Kleiman last night after the game, we've waited long enough to, to talk about it. Uh, let's dive into to, to Avery Johnson, whatever you want to call him. You can call him Avery. You can call him the golden boy. You can call him the chosen one. Um, I think all those names are uh, right now. They're still intact to call him. Uh, he gets in as the second quarterback and the only other quarterback. So before we fully dive into his play, I'll let both of you kind of give your thoughts on uh, what it might mean that he was the only other quarterback after Will Howard get in and we didn't see Jake Rubley yesterday. I'll let Drew lead this one off. So the fact that we saw him and not Jake Rubley, it, it's, it's tough because uh, like with – what, with what Chris Klein was talking about, him and Colin Klein kind of went over, like, these are some situations that we're going to see. And if the game is out of hand, like, why not have Avery Johnson come in and play more than, like, one series? Because he only gets four games. If if they want to redshirt him, he only gets four games plus the bowl game. So why not let him get more reps and more game experience? But it's also just not out of the question to think that he has taken over the QB2 job because he didn't have to be on the first depth chart and they put him on as an or, and then he came in and played right away. So it, it, it's one of those where it, it's hard to really take away anything because Jake Ruby has also been hurt during camp, but it's also just not insignificant that he was the only quarterback to take a snap. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think, you know, uh, first of all, Kleiman and Klein have been pretty metic meticulous with this kind of stuff in the past. So I think there definitely was a plan for how they were going to attack this. But it does – it's also pretty telling that um, Avery got all the snaps and uh, and took advantage of them. And, you know, I'm sure that's based on what they've seen in fall camp so far. Um, but in this area, it's going to be hard to keep everybody happy. So it's, you know, I think – uh, playing time and when it matter and, and the first game matters is going to matter to to both those guys. So <clears throat> it's hard not to read too much into it, but I think Drew's right too. You can't read over over read it as well. So we'll see what happens. But it was good to see Johnson play well. Yeah, I, I the one thing that I I think it probably means is because Chris Kleiman's explanation, like you said, Drew, it makes total sense. And it, it all adds up where he's like, hey, you know, we looked at it and thought we want to be able to give him like meaningful experience type reps where it's you're going to get a couple of series. You're going to get to play this out like a full game as opposed to, you know, teams with more established depth behind their their starting quarterback. They'll just kind of rotate them through and see three or four quarterbacks, you know, play in the game. But I think for what K-State ended up doing, it was they wanted to, to get Avery Johnson out there, give him real experience, and that makes sense. But the reason why I think it kind of, you know, even though I was already starting to lean this way since they put him on the depth chart, they're talking him up like crazy. I think Avery Johnson is the legitimate number two quarterback on this team because think about, have we ever seen Jake Rubley with that much ex extended time on the field? I mean, probably the most consecutive snaps he played was when Will got hurt against TCU last year. And he had to go out there and, you know, they fed him to the wolves with the quarterback sneak and, and everything else. And it just, it didn't look great. And maybe that's, you know, what they've realized is, Hey, Will took forever to get it going because we weren't able to give him like legit going to get your feet wet experience. It was just thrown to the fire. Jake Rubley, it, I really hasn't had any of that. Like I'm, I'm going through and I'm trying to, to look back right now. Um, just like the the total experience that that Rubley has, like over the last two years, how many times he's actually gotten in games, and it's it's not a ton. So I mean, I, I think that there are multiple reasons and levels to it, and partly, yes, what they said is true. Like just wanted to give Avery Johnson a chance that obviously Jake Rubley has had a couple more times than him, um, but it's not like Rubley's had that many more. 
And so if you're really concerned about who your second quarterback is going to be, and if it was going to be Jake Rubley, I think then you probably would have put him in there a little bit more than last night, which obviously was zero. So I, I think it probably means that if, if Will Howard were to go down and it, K-State has had some bad luck at quarterback for the last, you know, now with guys getting hurt. So they're probably due for a clean year. But if he were to go down, I, I'm under the belief that if it was for a long time, it would be the Avery Johnson show. And then uh, we would see what, what went on from there. That's just how it, how it makes sense to me based off of kind of what we've seen and what the numbers look like when you try to, you know, stack it all up against Jake Rubley and, and how much he's played. All right, we can, uh, we can roll on here, keep things kind of moving. Uh, a couple of things that I want to take note of real quick. These aren't, these aren't necessarily crazy, and maybe you guys have seen them. Uh, K-State SID Ryan Lackey put these out yesterday, but I thought they were kind of fascinating, and I retweeted them. Uh, the kickoff temperature was 100 degrees yesterday, which was the third highest in school history, which might surprise some people, um, but it was, must have been less humid or something yesterday than some of those other games, and the sun had, had gone down pretty quick. And if you were in the shade, it wasn't too bad. Uh, if you guys didn't see it, any guesses as to what the uh, previous two hottest kickoff temps in K State history? I saw I it. So I'm not gonna one cheat. of them was okay. Uh, yeah, I, I saw them both too. Okay, uh, they kind of blew my mind. 109 against Louisiana Tech in 2000 is uh, the hottest, which. 2023 would they not just move the game time for that and be like hey, 109 we're not gonna throw you yeah. out there and then uh and then 102 against uh louisiana in 2013 so those were uh, the hottest I, a lot of people always talk about like iowa and arrowhead and the the 2013 north dakota state loss as being hot game the, the iowa one always sticks out to me that one was hot um, the, the come, you know, so hot too. yeah. So, uh, the other note that I, I thought was interesting, uh, Ben Sennett reached hundred receiving yards, which is a career high. And, uh, mm -hmm. the first K state tied in to have a hundred yards receiving in a game since 2006. Uh, so that was a, a pretty impressive mark for Ben Sennett yesterday. And just like Will Howard kind of keeps ascending and reaching these marks that we see him on the trajectory to get to. That's the same thing for Benson. I mean, Drew, you already brought it up about like where he was mocked and the fact that, hey, he's going to be a, a top three tight end possibly in this year's NFL draft. Like he's hitting the benchmarks that, that a guy like that needs to, to continue to be in that position. So I, I think it's uh, very encouraging to see uh, the growth that they had there. I, I, I should have looked it up, but the trivia would be who was the last Bill Snyder tight end to have 100 yards because neither one of these have been Bill Snyder tight ends. That's true. Yeah, I guess, yeah, 06 would have been Prince's first year. Boy, well, I could not help you out on that because, uh, I mean. I, I should have looked it up. I should have looked it up. For a Snyder tight end to do it, it would have been, I was either seven years old or younger. So I I definitely don't know tight ends from uh, that era of uh, Bill Snyder football. So, well, that that might be something after the show that, that, that I'll have to go do some digging on. Or – uh, we just wait till Tuesday and we'll spring it on Ryan Lackey and say, hey, uh, you know, this was brought up on, on Sunday, but who was the last Snyder tight end to actually make it happen? So uh, Snyder was not tight end you, I guess. To do it, it, to get 100 yards just in one half and then not get a target in the second half just shows how good he was in the first half. Well, he's getting the ball too much. So, you know, it happens. <laughs> Uh, all right, we'll, we'll move on here. Since uh, since Fan has dove into all the stats and numbers, I'm going to guess that he's got most of these pretty well memorized. So I want to try to stop. It may not come across as well as I as I want to, uh, but I want to see if Drew can match or at least you know kind of compete with knowing what statistical benchmarks K State was able to hit uh, in, in yesterday's game against Semo. So. I'll start off with an easy one, I guess, uh, mainly just because, you know, I guess it, maybe it's not as easy due to the fact that uh, we've talked about these. So I, I, I knock out any receiver trivia um, here. Here's where I'll start. DJ Giddens and Trayshawn Ward. DJ Giddens did have the most carries yesterday, but there's been a lot of, you know, conversation about how the carries would work out. 
did DJ Giddens outpace Treshawn Ward by five or more carries in yesterday's game? Uh, no, I think it was four. All right, we'll we'll, we'll go to Fan to to make sure he's 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 on top of it. Well, it, see that this where it depends on if you count garbage or non garbage. See that's oh. that's the that's the rub. Drew is correct. Drew is correct. But in, in non garbage time, and even, I'm even including this first drive of the second half. DJ had 15 carries, and and Treshawn had eight up to that point. Treshawn had a few more later, um, but uh, I did look that up. Uh, on those non-garbage DJ carries, his success rate was 66.7%, and uh, Ward's was 50%. They both had good days, 8.5, 6.1 yards per carry. I mean, it it kind of refutes the point I made about the offensive line earlier because they though they did both end up with great days, but you know they did have that bad stretch. But yeah, I would I say, say that, I would give Drew the nod on that. For yeah, the, that, for the full context of the game. You're right on the offensive line. Like they, <laughs> there was that stretch there where. I like I it was I was second quarter when I was still on the field getting highlights and stuff and I I thought in the back of my head, I was like eh, running backs aren't really breaking away as much as I thought they might and then pretty much after that thought popped into my head that's yeah. when when DJ started breaking one off I, the Treshawn Ward touchdown happened right in front of me that wasn't a touchdown so that was a little bit disappointing because uh, we would have had awesome video for it it just didn't count so you know who cares about not being a touchdown. Uh, we'll, we'll move on here and, and see uh, what else we can find here that, that might be notable. Uh, this was, I mean, this is a pretty substantial number that was put up yesterday. Uh, do either of you know how many tackles for loss K-State had in yesterday's game? Yeah, on the 11. number is what I'm looking for. I think it's 11. Okay. We go to our uh, our fact checker yeah, I, uh, fan to see. If I'm, that's, I will that's fact accurate. check it. Yeah, eleven looks correct. Um, they, they, the the havoc rate in non garbage time was twenty two percent, which is really good. That includes pass breakups and interceptions as well, which we didn't have an interception. But um, yeah, they they were they were, you know, there was so much hype about uh, the Geno Hess, the running back, coming into the game as. Uh, he was a Ohio Valley player of the year last year. Um, one of the candidates for the FCS Heisman, I can't remember what it's called, but Walter Payton Ward, I think. And uh, he was held to negative four yards rushing. So pretty impressive by the K-State defense against what I, th I still think is a pretty good running back, but he didn't do much against K-State for sure. I don't want to disparage the Ohio Valley, but there's only like five teams <laughs> in the Ohio Valley that play football. <laughs> I, was, I looked it's, it up and I was like – true. <laughs> why are these not in the Missouri Valley where there's a bunch of other teams that they could play? Uh, I was honestly surprised to see that SEMO wasn't in the Missouri Valley, but I guess they're just like too far, what, south and east in, in Missouri to, to slide into the valley with everybody else. Um, so uh, real quick, were, were you guys, I guess, surprised at all that K-State wasn't able to, to force any kind of turnover in yesterday's game? Because that's one of those things that, um, this first time against an FCS opponent that Chris Kleiman's team uh, at K-State did not force a turnover in a game like that. And we knew that maybe it would be questionable with breaking in a bunch of new guys in the secondary. Um, and obviously there was a lot of pressure that maybe could have caused the fumble at some point, but the ball never popped free. Um, any surprise at K-State wasn't able to turn over SEMO? I guess they did have – maybe they had the fumble recovery, or they called him down. So, yeah, they didn't end yeah. up forcing a turnover yesterday. Yeah. So, any any surprises there? I'm I'm a I'm a believer in turnover luck as a as a thing, and I just you know like you said there were there were opportunities there to force some, and you know you really I will give that I mean the quarterback you got he's an experienced guy he didn't really try to force any balls their their passing game was safe Drew and I talked a lot during the game about how many bubble screens and quick now screens and quick throws rollout passes like I think they had a very safe game plan to not to to kind of avert those as well. You know, so I, I'm not really concerned about that after this one. All yeah, right, I'm not uh, too concerned couple, about oh, uh, no turnovers either. Yeah, I'm not too uh, concerned about that, no turnovers either. And, like, it was kind of like what Jimmy and I were talking about during the game. Like, it was – it almost felt like they were playing – they were like uh, – SEMA was just playing pretty vanilla in their game plan. Like – 
Chris Kleiman against Oklahoma State 2019. Like, eh, <laughs> we're not going to win this thing. Let's not get beat too bad here and not look, you know, get get uh, our, you know, breaks beat off or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that probably jives with what I saw out there. Like, it didn't seem like they were taking – too many chances it was hey if we we get some some windows here to kind of move the ball we're going to do it but we're not going to force anything and uh, uh it worked out well for k-state yesterday 45 to nothing there there should be zero complaints uh about that and, and how it ends up working out all right uh final final number that i'll i'll try and you know kind of grill you guys on now uh drew this might be where you get a leg up on on fan because he he left he said well we're in garbage time now i'm gonna beat this traffic <laughs> that is just idiotic for whoever just okayed <laughs> construction on i-70 at this time of the year i mean i don't know what kind of punishment we need for him i suggested to my wife yesterday they should have to be lined up and we just let will howard rip balls into him and just you know for like five minutes straight that's your punishment because i you know you're probably a nice person you're probably a great family man or woman whoever made that decision but you you suck i you just gotta say it you suck so Apologies on that. Uh, all right, yesterday, Avery Johnson. Any guesses on the total number of yards he had combined passing and rushing? Uh, I'll, I'll give whoever gets closest to the number here the, the win for this game that we just played because Drew was pretty on top of it, uh, and obviously Fan had, had it all in his head. So whoever's closest to the number of combined rushing and passing yards for Avery Johnson uh, gets the win here. Uh, I believe it was 90. I had him at 87. Okay. Well, fan is right on the number. So, uh, Drew, I, Drew's going off his head, I think. Fan might have the numbers in no, front of him. No, I, uh, I, know, what, to, I know what Drew looked, Drew, looked of, at, but... Drew looked at his total gained yards rushing, which was 35, but he had a, a three-yard loss. So, he had a 32 yards rushing instead of 35. That's what he looked at. This will do it to you. I think that's the silliest <laughs> thing when they hand you the final stats and it's like the first number is like gain. It's like, well, yeah, yes, I don't like that either. That's dumb. Like that's going to change my opinion of how somebody played. It's like, you know, oh, this guy, he gained, he gained, you know, 50 yards today, but he lost 25. Like, well, then he ran for 25 <laughs> yards. That's, that's what he was worth. Uh, it kind of, that's one of those that like goes to show that even like very simple, like what would have been considered advanced statistics 50 years ago, like yards per carry or something are so much more valuable than like total numbers uh, that, that you'll end up getting kind of cranked out and everything. So uh, good, good go of it there. We'll, we'll have it a, a little bit better put together for uh, next week, mainly because uh, it's an 11 a.m. game. So a little bit more time to prepare, a little bit more sleep to, to get things fired up on, but uh, uh, good job there for, for everybody. Uh, real quick, final you know tally on yards for K State yesterday was five eighty eight. Uh, so they did it both through the air and on the ground. And uh, real quick before we dive into to one of our our final segments here, um, with the the throws that Avery Johnson made, there weren't a ton of them that he had to. Now sometimes he he would drop back and kind of reverted to running, and that was one of my worries was that he would get the the pass plays called for him but he would bail pretty early and, and kind of try to rely on his legs. I thought he did better than what I thought. I think, you know, things collapsed, and he was like, well, I can score if I run, and I'll do it. What you guys make of what you saw from him throwing the ball and when he dropped back yesterday? Uh, so when he dropped back, I, I thought that he really – that's when – the highlight plays all came from his runs, but I thought his passes were, was where he really popped. Uh, the one to Trey Spivey really stands out. That was a great throw and a great adjustment by Spivey to go up and get it. And then he had that one uh, where he was on the run and threw it off balance to, I think it was Xavier Lloyd for a pretty big gain too. So, yes, he ran a lot when he when I passed those calls, but he kept his head up pretty well for, for an 18-year-old. That was pretty impressive. Yeah, no, I, I, not a lot to add. I, I would agree it looked – like he looked in high school on film, I you know saw several of his games on film, and uh, he's he's got a solid arm. He's he can be a pocket guy if he needs to be, but obviously he's got good speed and athleticism to run it too. Yeah, it was uh, it was exciting night to kind of see what that could be like, and uh, 
I'm sure that uh, Chris Kleiman would say yes if you told him, hey, he's going to get to play in garbage time next week too. Uh, they would take that right. They could just kind of beat Troy. Uh, we'll move on. This is where we'll take a look at everything outside of K-State. So we've 30-plus uh, minutes talking about the Wildcats. Uh, that's obviously what, what most people are concerned about. But the people also like to hear the takes uh, outside of K-State football, and there are certainly a lot of them to be had after what we saw yesterday. So this this is a segment we call College Football Outsider because uh, we are not insiders on any of these teams that we are about to talk about. We get to judge them from TVs and box scores we see on the internet from afar and uh, call guys like Dave Aranda a fraud. I Brian Smoller, like – jump back 15 yards when I told him after the game last night I was like well I think Dave Aranda's a fraud so he's like what you do I was like yeah and I just kind of like started ripping off why I thought so I was like well you know kind of a weird guy uh I feel like if you don't have talent and you're a weird guy dudes just don't really have a lot of buy-in a lot of enthusiasm um and you know Joey McGuire and all those assistants were probably the key to success down there in Waco for him and that that shown through Bad showing for the day is where we will start on this. Who had the worst day of the Big 12 schools that lost yesterday? Or I'll throw Oklahoma State in here because they only won 27-13 to 13 and played three different quarterbacks. If you want to say that they had the worst day uh, against Central Arkansas, it's a team that I think they may have played last year and beat by like 50 points. Uh, who, who had the worst day in the Big 12 yesterday? I mean, I think pointing out Baylor's day, is, is, is a good one, but I'm, <clears throat> it's hard not to go with Texas tech with the hype they were getting as as the sleeper team and the team that could push for the big 12 and, and go into Wyoming and losing. And I don't think Wyoming is particularly great. You know, TCU could be thrown in there as well, coming off a national championship game appearance. And, you know, maybe it says more about Dion and, and what he's doing at Colorado than TCU, but um, I, I'm going to of those three, I'd probably go with Texas tech. West Virginia also lost, but I don't think they're any good. So that one didn't surprise me much. I actually think West Virginia played better. I, I'm I'm more <laughs> impressed by West Virginia that they only lost by 23. So Neil Brown might keep his job now. That's my takeaway from yesterday. Now, uh, I'm with you. It probably is Tech. And especially when you factor in this. This is like Tech fans excited for this for the last however many years. They've not cared about football, really. They've wanted it to be good, but – basketball is their number one they're packing it in and then baseball is the number two like there was a ton of excitement for base 19 uh when we were down there for power cat game day and john was talking to one of their radio guys and was like so like what's the what's the vibe here right now like where does tech football rank and the guy's like oh it's definitely third he's like uh he's like basketball's clearly number one and that you know they were just coming off um the, the national championship appearance and then he's like baseball is big and then football is right there. Why? Because Joey McGuire has all this energy. And really, their improvement last year, I think, was solely due to, like, a vibe change. Like, they get a guy in there in Joey McGuire that understands the environment. People really like him. He's got this great staff. They're doing great things. And they had all this hype. And what sucks for those Tech fans is this season starts on the road, first and foremost. So you're not even getting to see that team at home. Then they lose to Wyoming. And now your marquee non-con game, probably the, the biggest non-conference game that you will have in a 20-year period at Texas Tech, Oregon coming to Lubbock next weekend, really feels like a, a missed like opportunity and like there's going to just be a ton of air that's been pushed out of it. And it, Tech can kind of all around if they beat Oregon next week, but Oregon, even against crappy Portland State, put up 81 points today. Tech is in a really tough spot because – this season that looked like it could be in a really good position, all of a sudden they're probably looking at, you know, two immediate losses in non-conference play, and uh, that does not breed any confidence for what you might face in the Big 12 this year when you know that both K-State and Texas are on your schedule this season. Yeah, it, it's a rough day for uh, Texas Tech uh, yesterday. It, it's, it's why when I was pointing out uh, schedules throughout the summer, I was like, so this is a really tricky game going to Wyoming. I don't think Wyoming's that great, but going to the altitude, playing a road game against a capable opponent right before you played Oregon, it's just kind of a, a, a weird thing to open the season for me. But I, I mean, I think that the, the, the clear 
loser this this weekend was Baylor. Texas State was picked to win like two or three games all year and goes in to Waco and puts up 42 points on on Baylor's defense, which wasn't very good last year. And Dave Miranda's a defensive guy, and the defense didn't really get it figured out. The offense started slow. Like, it, it, it looks like it might be a long year for Baylor if they can't get it figured out. I mean, next week they played they play Utah, so it's not like their schedule gets any easier either. Yeah, that's uh, that's not great. And I honestly, the most concerning thing for Baylor yesterday was the fact that Blake Shapin played well. Like I, he's the guy that I threw a lot of Baylor blame on, and he was like, he. I think he only threw ten incompletions on like thirty some attempts, over three hundred yards, two touchdowns, no picks, one rushing touchdown. But the offensive line let him get battered. He didn't even finish the game in at quarterback because he couldn't. Uh, yeah, that's a bad showing for Baylor. And I'll say this on TCU. I think what we learned yesterday in that game is a, is two things. TCU is is not as good as people would have expected. They, they have the awesome year last year, and they, they come back and you think, okay, they'll be a pretty respectable team. That's just people not paying much attention. With what they lost, they were going to be pretty down. They, they were probably more of like a six or – they're probably more of a seven-win team this year. Uh, and what we learned in Colorado is that people thinking that they were only going to win like two or three games with – all of that firepower on on their squad, probably closer to five or six would be my assumption for Colorado. Now, I don't know their schedule off the top of my head, so if it works out well enough in the Pac-12, they could probably sneak up to seven or eight. I'm still not going to like fully buy in. It's just absolute mom now that Dion is there uh, and that the house of cards might tumble at some point, but he certainly proved that he's got enough there that they can put it together in any game and, and make it happen if you let them. And TCU's defense was bad enough yesterday to let them make it happen. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see moving forward what, what comes out of that. Any other thoughts outside of uh, K-State football and around college football that you guys uh, want to pop off before we finish things off? Uh, I'll just throw in that TCU's a lot 110 points in the last two games. So... <laughs> <laughs> That might be something to watch. Uh, well, but like, how many of those are in garbage time? So they don't really count, you know. <laughs> Good point. Although yesterday they all count because it was a close game. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, they, they all count. I guess most of those Georgia ones probably don't, though. That feel. Yeah, that was over by half fan, or is that cheating to 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 be like? Oh well, we got beat so bad. Those points don't count. Garbage time. Like, can you do that, or would that be lying to yourself as a coach? Well, yeah, a little bit. But when you look at like, if you're giving up six or you know six points a drive before garbage time, that tells the story all you need to know, and that your defense was really, really bad. And I think that's the Georgia game. That was definitely the case. Uh, T. I'm trying to look here what TCU uh, has. They've got Nichols next week, which, hey, we know Nichols, no no pushover. Uh, I don't know if Tim Rebo, their coach, is still there. I just remember him walking in uh, after that first Chris Kleiman game and just like – he's like, it's like, ah, you can look at the this – this shit, we just got our ass kicked. Like he was uh, very upfront about it. Uh, TCU – They've got a weird schedule because they'll play, they'll start conference play week three at Houston before they come back home to play SMU. Um, they have probably the easiest start to Big 12 play. Their first four conference games are at Houston, West Virginia, at Iowa State, and BYU before they come to Manhattan and take on K State. And then things get really tough because it's at K State, at Tech, Texas, Baylor, at Oklahoma. So, uh, the TCU might be able to fool some people or like halfway through the year, like, okay, they've bounced back, but we should probably take mental note of what happened against Colorado and, and, uh, hide it away and bring it back out come mid October when they, they meet K state. Um, so that, that's where I, I stand with that. Any, any final thoughts or ready to move on? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Uh, I will say this though, Texas, you should have beat Rice by a little bit more than that. And I think we, we know what the, you know, I think they're going to be basically the same team as last year. Like 
they shouldn't have had an excuse yesterday. They've got one of the best offensive lines in the league. They've got probably the best receiving core in the league. Um, and Quinn Ewers is supposed to be this wildly awesome guy. And he wasn't even bad yesterday. But Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson made that team last year. And until they get the running back thing figured out, they're probably going to be similar to the same Texas team we've seen, you know, last year and, and some years prior to that when they've been good, but maybe not as good as people would expect in what they say on paper. So I just throw that out there on Texas. I wasn't wildly impressed, but now they go to Alabama uh, this this coming weekend and, you know, they can, they can get everybody back on the wagon that way. Uh, we'll finish things off, bring it back at it from a K-State perspective, uh, I'll ask each of you this. One question that you have for, for next week's game against Troy, and you can either answer this in a question that you have about what you want to see from K-State on the field or a question that you want to hear Chris Kleiman answer on Tuesday that might be sticking out in your head. Um, for example, and this isn't for, for Chris Kleiman, but on Tuesday I want to ask Will Howard uh, why all but Jacob Knuth at quarterback went without the elastic in the – the full droopy sleeve, you know, 1990s style on the quarterbacks. Uh, that would be my question for this coming week. You guys probably have more serious football questions than I had there, but that's going to eat at me until I get an answer for it on why they made that switch and decision. Because uh, I had some some buddies texting me last night. They were making fun of Avery Johnson uh, saying, "You come on, you can't be that good and wear your sleeves like that. Nobody does it anymore. You like, look like a nerd. So uh, what questions do you guys have? Uh, moving forward for next week, one question each. Uh, we'll let Fan lead it off. Yeah, I think uh, uh, K-State's going to face a, a pretty good test in uh, running back Kamani Vidal, who ran for 248 yards on 25 carries. Granted, it was against Stephen F. Austin, but you know we faced a, a good FCS back and handled it, and will they handle that test next week against Vidal, who's – had a really good game and was a preseason uh, Sun Belt player, uh, all, all Sun Belt. So he's going to be a test. They get. They also have a very experienced quarterback. They've got some experienced receivers back. Um, their defense was their strength last year. Uh, they lost quite a bit on defense. So perhaps Troy's offense will be more of the test than their defense, but we'll see. Uh, my question for this week will be, uh, can the receivers do it two games in a row? Like, it, it, it's one thing to do it against FEMO. Can you do it again against Troy, who is significantly better? Can can you do it again? Because I think that we're all kind of wait and see. Everybody was pretty cautiously optimistic about how the receiving core would look. But now it's, can you do it again? Yeah, I mean, it's probably been 2019, Kleiman's first year, where in the non-conference against your two, you know, non-Power 5 opponents – K-State went out and just dominated both of them. Uh, I think, I mean, that year it was Nichols, and then I think Bowling Green was the other one. And, and K-State kind of ripped through both of them. But since then, obviously, 2020, we know they lost to Arkansas State. Uh, 2021, Skyler gets hurt in the, the Southern Illinois game. So that's the only time an FCS opponent played K-State close uh, under Chris Kleiman was when Skyler went down in Illinois, and they, they made it. K-State got a big lead. And then last year, obviously, Tulane was able to come away with a win. So it may not mean anything, but I, I think it is interesting to watch to see how K-State bounces back. And I don't know, I just based off what I saw yesterday and the way things seem to be moving, I think it probably helps that Chris Kleiman can go back and say, and look, like, hey, the last three seasons, we've not taken care of business in the non-conference like we're capable of. So let's go out and do it. And, and like Fan just said, it seems like the Troy defense might be a weak spot. And if that's the case, then I like K-State's great offense against Troy's weaker defense than Troy's what could be solid offense against K-State's unproven defense. So uh, I, I think that is probably a game where K-State probably takes care of it. And, you know, it'll be closer than what this week was, 45 to nothing. But I do anticipate K State probably pulls away by three scores next week. That would be uh, my prediction to, to to lead things off. Not to give too much away, but that's where I stand. Uh, any final thoughts from you guys on on this weekend or uh, looking ahead to Troy? That should be another fun game. Uh, different different atmosphere at eleven o'clock than six o'clock, I think. But 
hopefully it looks like it might start to cool down a little bit more than we thought initially. Uh, it would be nice to not be 100 degrees again again next week. So we'll see. It should be fun. It's going to be fun to be back in the bill and and, I, and hopefully break that G5 hex that we seem to have. <laughs> yeah, no alternate uniforms, Chris. Keep them keep by this week. <laughs> it's true. I didn't believe in that until last year. And then I was just like, you know what? Might as well not yeah. mess with it. Although my suggestion was they should have worn them against Alabama to see if like you could just, you know, break the curse there. Like nothing to lose in that game. We're yeah. there, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if those ever see the light of day again under Chris Kleiman. All right. Uh, we will uh, yeah, we'll wrap I'll things up. Oh, go ahead, Drew. I was going to say, I'll just echo that. Like, it, it, it's going to be fun to be back in Manhattan again. The atmosphere will be a little bit different because it's at 11. And as long as it's not, like, 3,000 degrees outside, I feel like everybody, the excitement was in the air all night last night. So I'm excited to see how the atmosphere builds all season. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to hear that it may not be as hot as originally anticipated. That makes it a little bit more entertaining i will say i made fun of gus johnson on the fox broadcast yesterday for tcu colorado he made some comment about how it was like 80 some degrees at kickoff in fort worth and he's like yeah it feels like uh you know a big cool down it's been triple digits the last however many days and i'm thinking it's 11 a.m gus like it, this is the coolest <laughs> part of the day there it's it is going to be you know midnight triple digits by the time the game finishes i didn't look to see what it got up to but uh that cracked me up with gus johnson not knowing weather patterns and, and how that ends up working out so uh that will that will do it for us today we will be back next weekend uh after k-state and troy hit the field see how that goes uh the wildcats able to start it one and oh this year with a 45 nothing win semo and uh, we'll have plenty of content throughout the the rest of the week here on the youtube that you can get uh, D.Y. will be back tomorrow with a quick little recap show, get his thoughts, and uh, dive into a couple of things. And then Tuesday's the big day. We'll get to hear from Chris Kleiman, uh, get some some notes from him and the players. A recap from that will come on Wednesday. And then uh, be ready because we'll, we'll get ready to start prepping for Troy come la latter half of the week. And then obviously get to K-State online. Tons of great information and coverage there. Uh, more so for Drew and D.Y., uh, as they put in a bunch of work there. Fan also making his contributions yesterday. I was just kind of farting around. That should do it for us. We'll be back, like I said, next week. So for Drew, for Fan, I'm Mason, and uh, we'll see you next time here on K-State Online.